Hello, everyone. I am Adriana Pavletic. I am family physician at the National Institute of Mental Health, Office of the Clinical Director. I have been providing clinical support for PhD investigators at NIMH, and one of my role has been medical screening of healthy volunteers. These are my personal views, not views of NIMH or NIH, and I don't have any conflict of interest. However, I must admit that I am biased because I think that medical screening is very important, and I compare it to um, foundation of a house. It requires lots of work. You don't see it, but if not well done, your house may have a problem. In this presentation, I will discuss why screening healthy volunteers matters, why we do medical screening in addition to mental health screening. I will describe screening procedures and demystify so-called physicals. And I will also uh, address harms of screening and ways to mitigate them. So why do we care about healthy volunteers? Well, healthy volunteers play an important role in clinical research. In addition to patients who participate in therapeutic research and receive direct health benefit from their participation, a significant proportion of research participants at NIH Clinical Center are research volunteers. Studies with research volunteers are designed primarily to develop new knowledge, not to provide direct health benefit for participants. And the research volunteers can serve as patient volunteers and as healthy volunteers. In fact, almost 300 studies at NIH currently enroll healthy volunteers, and 76% of studies at NIMH, Mental Health Institute, enroll healthy volunteers. Healthy volunteers can serve as primary participants and as controls. And I will use this um, term healthy volunteer or control uh, interchangeably. So controls are important in clinical settings, as illustrated in this example. A 79-year-old, previously healthy and extremely fit male developed progressive shortness of breath. His pulmonary function tests were surprisingly normal. Initially, I thought that his tests were normal because he was compared to a average 79 year old, not extremely fit 79 year olds. However, examining the report, I saw that he was compared to 79 year old females. And that's why he not, his numbers were so high. When the error was discovered and corrected, his numbers changed. And you can see uh, that 93 dropped to 76 and 76 uh, dropped to 52. So why am I telling you this story? Well, research results depend on controls as well. For example, whether patients with schizophrenia are found to have lateral ventricular enlargement depends on the choice of controls and not on patients. So what are the characteristics of healthy controls? They are defined by study eligibility criteria. A new principal investigators, you design uh, eligibility criteria to ensure safety of participants and validity of your research. So for example, uh, let's uh, take an example of uh, fear conditioning study. Uh, 
researchers use fear conditioning experiments to research, to do research on anxiety. So they provoke, these are provocative studies to induce anxiety with different methods. For example, loud noises or electric nerve stimulation where they apply weak electric shocks on the forearm. So that creates anxiety because some of these um, procedures are uh, ex uh, expected, some are unexpected. And then also researchers do uh, functional brain MRI to see um, how uh, the brain reacts to anxiety and fear. So because anxiety can elevate blood pressure, you don't want to include people who already have high blood pressure. So hypertension will be your exclusionary criteria for that study. But is that enough? you also need to ascertain that your participants don't have hypertension. So how will you do that? You will screen them. You will first ask them whether they have hypertension and they may say no. So is that enough? Can you rely on volunteer self-report? Well, not always because hypertension may be asymptomatic, and some people who tell you that they don't have it may in, in fact have hypertension. Uh, hypertension develops slowly, your body adapts to it, and most people don't have any symptoms. Some people may have elevated blood pressure because they take some medications, psychostimulant drugs, some illegal drugs, and that can also pose danger if they, you include them and they participate in your study. So if you want to assure that it is safe uh, for participants to, to uh, participate in that anxiety provoking experiment, you, will, you need to validate and you need to check their blood pressure. However, uh, healthy volunteers in neuroscience research are often less rigorously screened compared to patient volunteers. And what is for the reason for that? Sometimes um, researchers don't have clinical support. So what are the common reasons for inadequate screening of healthy volunteers? It can be a lack of clinical support for PhD investigators, lack of awareness. Common assumptions are that healthy volunteers are healthy, that they stay healthy, they, that they don't take any medications, but none of that is true. So screening is important because it also affects your research. For example, a multi-center comparison analysis found greater variance in cerebrospinal fluid biogenic amines among controls than among patients. One possible explanation was that the care in screening of healthy controls is not commensurate with that of patients. And that observation was made long time ago in 1990 and published in Archives of General Psychiatry, which is currently JAMA Psychiatry, one of the leading psychiatry journals. Authors proposed further study of the process by which controls are selected for experiments in psychiatry. Although this issue has long been recognized, it has not been addressed in research literature. Although this issue has long been recognized, it is rarely addressed in the research literature. Consequently, inadequate screening of healthy volunteers continues. 
2009 analysis of 474 neuroimaging studies reported that 75% of these studies relied on self-report or screening of healthy volunteers was not mentioned. Physical exam was done only in 7% of these studies. However, closer examination frequently shows that self-reported healthy volunteers have exclusionary criteria and should have been excluded from participations. And there is a high prevalence of exclusions, as you can see from the following example. All these self-reported uh, healthy volunteers passed initial phone screening. But when they were in, examined, um, exclusion rates range from 20% in our studies to 48% in Maziota studies. And we cannot compare these results because different studies have different eligibility criteria. For example, Stassel and um, collaborators had very stringent eligibility criteria and extensive evaluation. Uh, Maziota and his group worked on MRI atlas of healthy human brain. So they included healthy volunteers aged 18 to 90. Majority of their excluded participants were over age 60 and had hypertension and neurological problems. So what does healthy volunteer mean? It means different things to different people. In fact, there is a great heterogeneity of healthy volunteer samples. Studies have different study aims, different eligibility criteria, and different methods of screening. That's why we have high heterogeneity of healthy volunteer samples. So what is healthy volunteer in mental health research? The most important requirement is healthy brain and healthy nervous system. So we exclude participants with current psychiatric disorders, neurological disorders, brain injuries or infections, medical conditions that affect brain such as hypertension or diabetes, people who use psychoactive medications, use recreational drugs, or who excessively use alcohol. As I said earlier, I have been providing clinical support for NIMH studies led by PhD investigators. And my role has been medical screening and eligibility determination for various protocols, including functional MRI, PET scans, provocative fear conditioning experiments, and psychopharmacology studies, including studies with invest investigational new drugs. What are our screening procedures here at NIMH? We start with phone or online pre-screen. At that time, we also ask our participants for permission to review their medical record if they already have one. If they pass this initial pre-screen, we invite them for in-person evaluation. And that starts with informed consent, where we discuss our screening procedures and our study. And they have opportunity to ask questions. Next is mental health evaluation. And this is essential part of our screening. Our mental health clinicians conduct skid or structured clinical interview. Next is medical evaluation. 
uh, also frequently referred to as physical. The physical starts with vital signs and measurements. As you know, vital signs include blood pressure, pulse, respirations, and temperature. And often in that initial evaluation, we find exclusions. Some of examples are, for example, severe hypertension. Some of our uh, participants with hypertension were not aware that they have a problem, and some were taking uh, some medications or illegal drugs that can cause hypertension, and some uh, knew they had it, but didn't disclose it at initial screen. Uh, just recently, I saw a young 10-year-old uh, girl who had tachycardia. Tachycardia is a fast heartbeat, and her heartbeat was 135 beats per minute, and it should be less than 100. I thought she might have been anxious or maybe they rushed into the clinic because they were late. But this uh, fast heartbeat persisted on my exam and she had a uh, goiter as well. So her um, fast heartbeat was caused by high, uh, overactive thyroid gland, hyperthyroidism. Next are measurements, height, weight, and body mass index. A normal body mass index is between 18.5 and 24.9. And there we also found some exclusions. We found self-reported healthy volunteers with extremely low and extremely high BMI, as low as 14 and as high as 16. I think that vital signs and measurements are vital. You can see that this is a uh, old medical record before we used electronic medical record. And this self-reported healthy volunteer uh, passed mental health evaluation. And she denied ever having any mental health problems, any menstrual irregularity. She only reported few pounds of weight loss due to recent food poisoning. But as you can see, what was striking is extremely low weight for height, 83 pounds or 38 kilograms. So this is an example of anorexia nervosa, uh, potentially serious mental health condition. Actually, this is a mental health condition with highest mortality rate. So this particular participant had history of cardiac arrest that she reported years earlier when she was evaluated by another study. So medical history in a research setting has some specifics. We need to ask about current and recent participation in other studies, as well as future plans. Why is this important? It is important for both safety and validity of the research because participation in other studies may interfere with both safety and research validity. We also ask about recent blood donation because there is a limit on the amount of blood draw. And sometimes we need to postpone participation because of anemia that was, that's related to recent blood donation. Then comes general medical and psychiatric history. And very important part of history is study specific history where we go through eligibility criteria checklist. Although mental health and neuroscience uh, research healthy volunteers have some similar and identical um, 
baseline eligibility criteria, each study has some specific uh, exclusions that we need to address. After history comes physical exam, and you all know what physical means, but again, physical in a research setting has different purpose. We are not doing physicals to screen for cancers. And in fact, our physical exam is not intended to replace your physical at your uh, physician's office. So we pay attention to signs of IV drug use, self-injury, and you can see here that there is some injury on the skin, but this was due to a cat scratch. Here you can see examples of self-injury. So in the beginning of my work here, there was sometimes confusion with physicals and screening. And I will get this question from the research assistant. Healthy volunteer had recent physical. Can we skip the screening? And my answer was, we cannot skip the screening, but we may skip the physical. So when I entered the exam room, healthy volunteer stated that she doesn't need physical because she was evaluated three weeks ago and cleared for two and I made studies as a healthy volunteer. I explained to her that the purpose of her visit is not to have a physical, but to determine eligibility for study. And she applied for fear conditioning study, provocative study that I mentioned earlier. So when I review her medical records from prior evaluation three weeks ago, I saw that she had elevated potassium level. It was 6.4 at 8 a.m. and 5.8 at 12 p.m. And normal potassium level is between 3.3 and 5.2. So she had moderate hyperkalemia. And hyperkalemia is potential, potentially dangerous electrolyte abnormality, which can cause arrhythmia and uh, even death. So psychiatrists who did initial evaluation um, called internal medicine consult service, and they did extensive evaluation and concluded that the most probable reason for this um, potassium elevation was excessive consumption of potassium-rich dried fruits, which was considered accidental. So volunteer was advised to limit her dried fruits intake and to repeat electrolytes the following day. And the following day, her potassium was normal, but her sodium was little decreased. And I was a little concerned about these electrolyte abnormalities because it was a fear conditioning study that was provocative and I wanted to give her a clear bill of health. So we repeated her electrolytes and to my surprise, uh, her potassium was elevated again. When informed about result, Volunteers stated that she had large amount of dried fruit the previous night. So as you can see from this example, the purpose of laboratory assessment is to determine eligibility and to exclude people who may be at risk from research participation. And also to exclude people with conditions that affect results, which would have been in this case. This was an example of an eating disorder that presented as an abnormal lab result and volunteer passed mental health evaluation as normal. So how do we choose our screening labs? We need to take into account study aims and risks, characteristics of study population and resources. So balance is important and you should always involve clinicians. 
You don't want to order too many labs or tests, even if you have resources like we may have here at NIH. So for example, for studies with minimal risk, such as functional MRI studies of the brain, we only perform urine pregnancy tests to exclude women who may be pregnant because there is a potential or unknown risk for developing fetus, especially in MRI studies that use uh, very strong magnetic fields. We need to keep in mind that there are harms of screening. So our informed consents usually uh, talk about pain and infection and maybe fainting with a blood draw, but they don't mention that uh, you may get a false positive test. So more tests means more chance for an abnormal result. So we may get a false positive results. We sometimes get abnormal results of unknown clinical significance. And that requires additional testing and can cause anxiety. So let me give you an example. Healthy young volunteer uh, had to have a blood draw because she applied for a PET study. And PET study required arterial line placement. So we needed, and lots of blood draws. So we needed to make sure that she didn't have anemia or any bleeding tendencies. Her platelet count came back extremely low. Normal platelet count is about 100, 150,000, and hers was three, not 3,000, but three. And the rest of her labs were normal. So it looks like a false positive result, like possible lab error. And what happens with um, platelets is they sometimes, they clump. And if a machine uh, does uh, the test, they, it, that clump of uh, platelets can be missed. So I called the lab and they said, no, no, we did also a manual checkup and there were no platelets. There were only three platelets, basically no platelets. So how did that happen? So investigating further what happened, we learned that the sample was actually too small. And when the reag reagent was added, uh, platelets were destroyed. So this false positive result was actually uh, caused by a lab error, but created additional testing and anxiety uh, in healthy volunteer. Another harm, another example of harms of screening is uh, related to electrocardiograms in young healthy volunteers. And these electrocardiograms are often requires, required for psychopharmacology study. And they are reported as abnormal or borderline in over 20% of young healthy participants that have normal uh, cardiac history, no symptoms and normal exam. So we analyzed 500 consecutive uh, electrocardiograms uh, and found that majority are false positive or abnormal findings of low or uh, unknown clinical significance. Again, that can cause anxiety, additional testing, labeling, denial of participation in other studies and insurance problems. So it is important not to do electrocardiogram if your study doesn't pose any cardiac risk. I also counsel my participants about the possibility of abnormal or borderline electrocardiogram, even though 
they are healthy. And that alleviates anxiety because these abnormalities can be caused by exercise. For example, people who lift weights uh, may be found to have enlargement of uh, heart muscle, left ventricular hypertrophy, which is just caused by uh, weight training and not, and it's not a true uh, uh, problem. And actually six or seven of these participants had additional echocardiogram and on echocardiogram, they were all normal. So I prefer less labs because then I have to deal with less abnormal results. But sometimes we need comprehensive evaluation, such as in investigational new drug studies. And here is an example. 30-year-old healthy female applied for an investigational new drug study. And exclusion was elevation of liver function test greater than 50% above upper level of reference range. And liver function tests are two enzymes, ALT and AST. And L uh, Liver function test is actually a misnomer because these enzymes are also present in the muscle. They are highly concentrated in the liver, but because muscle mass is larger than a liver mass, uh, there is actually more of these uh, quote unquote liver enzymes in the muscle. So these participants, ALT and AST were quite elevated, almost three to almost four times of normal, 87 and uh, 120. However, because she uh, participated in investigational new drug study, she had comprehensive chemistry panel that also included creatine kinase. And creatine kinase is, must, is a muscle enzyme. And we see it elevated with any kind of muscle injury. It can be elevated in a heart attack. It can be elevated in um, strenuous exercise. And in her case, it was 100 times normal, 19,000. Normal is 26 to 192. So seeing how high her creatine kinase was, I immediately knew that her liver function tests were actually elevated because of a muscle injury, not because of a liver problem. And when I called her, she told me that she was um, training for a uh, tough mother, and that's some kind of a very strenuous uh, military style obstacle course. Usually if she didn't have, if I didn't have that creatine kinase, I would assume that her uh, abnormal labs were due to a liver problem. So I would ask her how much alcohol she drinks, if she takes Tylenol or any other drugs, or um, sometimes uh, we see those elevations in overweight people because they can be caused by fatty liver issue. So three weeks later, her labs were normal because she discontinued her strenuous exercise. Her numbers returned to normal. 87 dropped to 11, 120 dropped to 14, and 19,000 dropped to 108. And what is interesting in this case, despite this um, impressive abnormality, she didn't have any symptoms, or at least she didn't report them, and she had completely normal physical exam. 
So why, we, why do we do medical evaluations in mental health research? As I said, uh, mental health evaluation is essential. But what medical evaluation uh, provides is some objective methods, and they can uncover psychiatric disorders that are concealed during mental health evaluations. As discussed in previous slides, vital signs and measurements can detect, for example, anorexia nervosa, a serious mental health condition. Physical exam can detect um, IV drug use or self-injury. And laboratory tests and drug screens can detect eating disorders and drug use that are not reported on mental health evaluation or medical history. So it is very important to do screening beyond self-report. Without appropriate evaluation, characteristics of healthy volunteers are unknown. Reliance on self-report may result in inclusion of healthy volunteers who should have been excluded. Inclusion of healthy volunteers who meet exclusionary criteria can impact their safety. And validity of results may be affected unbeknownst to investigators. So in conclusion, the purpose of screening healthy volunteers is not to determine health, it's to determine eligibility. The purpose of eligibility criteria is safety and scientific validity. And screening beyond volunteer provided history is important for both safety and validity of research. So I published my observation in few reports and here are uh, links to them. I will be happy to entertain any questions if you have them. So please contact course organizers to get in touch with me. And thank you for your attention.